All right, so going through the, the last two things that we've covered, basically we've got the beginning of our business put together. You know, we figured out our article, we figured out our uh, choice of entity, we figured out our S Corp, C Corp, we got our, our agreement together. Now we're operating our business. So I know one of the biggest things that we talk about at this stage is gonna be employment contracts. Correct, correct. Um, yeah, so a lot of that is going to depend on the type of you know, a business you're running, right? Um, <clears throat> are there situations where you're working with a lot of, are they true employees or are they, now again, we're getting into a term of art, right? In, in, in the legal realm. Uh, are they true employees or are you dealing with a series of contractors? You know, and so that you don't get to decide as the employer um, who should be characterized as an employee or as, a contractor, that's something for the IRS to look at. That's going to be judged independently by these different regulatory bodies. Right? Well, and so I love there was a, a thing somebody posted online and they were like, taxes make no sense. Here's why. And it was like, you know, you have to um, you have to come up with how much you think you owe the government. The government knows how much you owe them, but they won't tell you that. You have to guess. And then if you get it wrong, they can send you to prison. <laughs> right. And so it's, it's very, very similar concept to the W2-1099. Like at the end of the day, you're deciding whether or not you're going to take out taxes. You're deciding whether or not you're going to have them on workers' comp. You're going to decide whether or not, you know, all these other dis decisions. But at the end of the day, the IRS is going to decide if you're right or not. And the penalty could be very costly if you're not. Definitely. So, yeah. So that's why, that's one aspect of this. Are you truly, do you truly have employees that are, and some of the things that the IRS would look at, for example, are, are you working for, you know, other businesses or are you only working for one business? You know, are you, um, you know, paid a salary or, or, or uh, salary or hourly or how does that work? You know, so, um, you know, a lot of people would rather, rather not characterize somebody as being an employee for tax purposes, but you don't get to make that call. You know? Right. So, I mean, putting aside that part, because really that's kind of a, a tax question for, sure. I'm talking about from the business law side, like putting together these agreements with contractors or with employees, you know, walk me through that process. Okay. Well, you know, first and foremost, uh, you want to be clear if it's, uh, you know, if it's with vendors or, uh, or clients and customers, you know, what are, what service are you offering as a business? Okay, how much does the service cost? But but well, actually, let me take a step back. You want to be very clear about what you're offering, what service or goods or, or a combination of both you're offering, and make sure that that's in your agreement with very clear terms for payment and what the obligations are for both the business and the and the um, and the customer or the vendor, right? All right. So basically, so really you're talking about this from both perspectives. You're talking about this from money into the business for services and money out of the business to vendors. Sure. Yep. So let's, for right now though, let's just focus on, you know, the business is hiring employees or they're hiring contractors to come in and do the work. Walk me through that process. And then we'll talk about contracts with customers and contracts with vendors or other businesses. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, certainly what you want to do is make sure that, uh, depending on the type of business it is, um, you know, that that uh, their responsibilities are clearly outlined, as we talked about. Um, and also, uh, if it is a, you know, particularly dangerous business or there are uh, risks involved somehow, that those are clearly stated, um, you know, uh, is there, uh, it should be somewhere indicated in there what the insurance situation you know, looks like, whether you're covering the employee and so forth, but also you want to set out your corporate culture in the agreement as well. What do you pride yourselves on doing? Um, what, um, you know, uh, what is acceptable at the workplace, acceptable behavior or not acceptable? Um, what are grounds for termination? Uh, so what do, are you provided three warnings? Are you, uh, can you be terminated on site? Um, in most circumstances, employers hold a lot of cards when it comes to 
terminating an employee. Uh, there are obviously some, some very big exceptions, and those usually have to do with whether you've been the victim of discrimination for race, ethnicity, right. uh, gender identity, so on and so forth. Um, but also there are medical leave issues as well. So, so in a, an employment agreement, you should address all those issues. What's acceptable workplace behavior? Um, you know, uh, in addition to, you know, any benefits, um, how you could potentially lose those benefits through your conduct as an employee. Basically what we talked about in terms of the LLC, we're talking about now with the employee, for example. You know, what are your right, what, what do you owe the, uh, in, this, in this arrangement that you have, uh, what do you owe the employee as an owner of a business and what does the employee owe you, you know? So, and I know Florida talks about it, what is it? It's an agreed upon exchange of detriments or something. What's, how does, what, how does Florida word that? Um, yeah, uh, and that's, and that's uh, there are other states and that's, that all that goes back to restatement of contracts and that kind of thing, but but it's the idea that you are, you know, you're giving something up, I guess, in essence. Um, you know, the employee is giving up obviously the time of their day. They're giving up their resources, their intellectual knowledge, their product knowledge, for example, that they can bring to bear on this, and the uh, employer is usually giving up money you know, or some kind of compensation that could be a combination of, you know, uh, a salary and benefits or anything like that. So that, that would be my understanding of that. Everybody's giving up a little something for this arrangement to work. Right. And so, and again, we're talking about such a minimal, minimal limitations on what you can agree to here. I mean, you know, we're talking about, we've got federal minimum wage, we've got state minimum wage, We've got some FMLA requirements for companies of all different sizes. Um, certain states may have a requirement for employer offered certain benefits at certain sizes. But really, I mean, we're we're almost unlimited in what can be agreed to here as long as it's legal. Correct. And just to add to what you said, obviously, uh, discrimination issues as well. You know that uh, you cannot, you know, discriminate. Or in this, in another aspect of this is. Uh, you know, you can't engage or perpetrate or put forward a hostile work environment. And right. that could be as an employee. That's not necessarily always top down, but if an employee is, you know, um, basically closing the door and exposing, you know, other employees to pornographic material or other offensive material or making comments or lewd suggestions, you know, all those things, um, you know, that – that should be outlined, and it could be easily outlined just saying that you're following federal and state protocol when it right. comes, you know. But there should be something in the workplace if you don't work in a virtual workplace that actually sets all those things out, and that's helpful for you to enforce later on. But to your point, yes, it's not. this is not rocket science like we're reinventing the wheel other than four or five areas that need to be addressed in an employment agreement, you can kind of tailor it the way you want, you know? So, and again, just make sure you have the, you know, the way to dissolve it. So what would be a termination for cause, a termination not for cause, what notice requirements you want, what sort of leave and other benefits you want to offer, plus, you know, the salary, the bonus structure, any, you know, any other compensation. Yeah, on that point too, I think it's important because I'm doing a lot of this type of work, or I've seen a lot of this recently, where um, you know it's always an issue. What is termination for cause? Because the trigger, if you terminate somebody for cause and you can prove it, then they can't get them. Un they can't get unemployment from you, basically. Right. Um, so I think it always helps in the employment agreement to have that kind of clearly stated. What would be at least some examples of, of termination for cause. You did this, you did that, you broke the law. You know, it doesn't matter necessarily um, what it is. If it doesn't hit those areas of protected classes, then it can be pretty much anything, you know? So that can be very helpful. But obviously the common ones we're looking for would be, you know, being so terrible at your job after receiving some sort of notice about it you know, maybe showing up drunk or otherwise intoxicated, committing crimes, you know, those would be like the, 
the most common for cause issues, right? Uh, yes. Um, oftentimes, um, for cause doesn't necessarily take into account your competency. That's usually used more if you violated a morals clause or anything like that. So in other words, you can oftentimes get unemployment benefits even if you were incompetent. Uh, yeah. Okay, so be more fraudulent. Or if you were fraudulent or okay. you were stealing from the company or you were, as you, I think you alluded to, not meeting your hours, you know, you're coming in late habitually, which we could also call time theft. Right. And those are the disqualifiers. But um, you can be, you know, even straying into negligence as an employee, if it's basically just costing them money because you're terrible at your job, they may still be able to get unemployment. All right. So now, Blair, you were talking about something to add to employment agreements, wanting to have the opportunity to have them not be able to compete against the business. And walk me through that. Yeah. Uh, well, in, uh, in most situations, uh, the law practice of law and, and hiring attorneys being uh, uh, the rare exception, most of the time you can put together a non-competition clause in your agreement uh, for your employees. And that's perfectly legal for you to do that because you are investing time in them, you're investing resources with them. You oftentimes don't want to lose talent that learned everything at your, at, you know, from your company. And then they're like, great, now I'm going to take this on the road or I'm going to form my own business and directly with, with your business. So uh, non-competition agreements are enforceable if they are reasonable. And that's a legal term to be uh, of art. If they're reasonable in terms of, uh, of time. So, um, you know, uh, generally speaking, for most businesses, a two-year uh, 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 provision in a non-compete you can't compete uh, with them for two years or maybe five years, depending on the type of business, um, you know, is going to be deemed reasonable uh, by a court. Uh, also, it has to be. Well, re jump in. So we're talking, we're looking at reasonable really in three factors. We're looking at a reasonable amount of time for you not compete. We're talking about a reasonable location for you not to compete them with inside that location. And we're talking about a reasonable limitation on what would be competition and what wouldn't be. Am I correct in that? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, and then we get to the geographical location portion of that, but that's exactly right. 